a silent, and the girl, the interviewer said to me, now, she said, does Jaw, JAWS work with Access? And JAWS is my speech software program, and Access is a database. At least I knew what she was talking about. And um, Access, and I thought, I have no idea. And I said, yes! And she went, phew! And I said, was that the right answer? And she goes, that was the only thing I was worried about. So I walked out of that interview with a job that I didn't know whether I was going to be able to perform or not. But guess what? The technology worked. Uh, with a lot of persistence and determination from my brother-in-law and law and myself, we got it going. So I completed um, that job, which involved ringing rugby players at night time, from seven till nine, three nights a week, asking them about their injuries and their game from the previous week. I was able to do that job because I had a converted headset for my computer and I had the braille um, card. So in my left hand I had braille cards with the rugby player's name on them and their phone number and in my right hand I dialed my keypad on my phone so that I could get their number. In my left ear I had the rugby player on the phone and in my right ear I had my computer software that was telling me where to enter the information into the database. And I use that example because it just demonstrates that the amount of skills that you have um, at your fingertips helps you create your own solutions. And for me that's been particularly important. And through asking for help I've been able to access all those skills that I've needed at the foundation of the blind. So that's been really important. So the more, the, skill, more, the more skills you have, the more solutions you have. Julie Woods, professional speaker and coach. P number six, laugh at yourself. Women are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they are until you dip them in hot water. Nancy Reagan, American First Lady. I was walking around to school with my son not long after my husband had left and I was contemplating whether I should change my name from Dalloway to Woods, or whether I'd keep Woods, or would it be Woods Dalloway? And I thought, well, I'll just see what Zach thinks. So I was walking around to school, and I said to him, Zach, have you um, thought about changing your name to Mum's name? And he goes, Julie! <laughs> what the hell am I going to call Julie for? <laughs> uh, so yes, I guess the answer was no. Um, it was 2003 and I was working at the Foundation of the Blind, sorry, it was 2004 at the Foundation of the Blind and I was working and there was an article that was about to appear in That's Life magazine. I'd been interviewed by them and I'd heard that the magazine was out. So I went down to my local sports dairy and I said to the guy behind the counter, do you have a copy of That's Life magazine? And he said, yeah, sure we do. It's just over here. And I thought, oh, great. And he gave it to me and I said, how much is it? And he said, $2.75. And I said, look, I haven't got any money with me now. I'll, I'll come back later. And he goes, no, 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 take it now. That's cool. So I took the magazine and I thought, oh, that's quite fair for $2.75. But that's cool. I hadn't bought a magazine, of course, not being able to see it. So I went back to my workplace and I sat at my desk and I heard my workmate coming down the corridor and I called out to her. She called out to me and said, Julie, I've got a copy of that Life magazine. And I held my one up and I said, so have I. And she goes, Julie, that's a penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> that bastard, he set me up. It's terrible. You wouldn't do that to a blind woman, would you? <laughs> so I thought, all right, what can I do? I waited two hours. I thought, at least I could, the minimum I could do was make him sweat. Um, so I went down back to the shop and I walked into the shop and the girls behind the counter said, do you want Paul? And I said, yes. And he came out, he was very sheepish. And I said, here's your $2.75, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, do you know what the worst thing was? And he said, what? I said, I held my face right up to the front to see if I'd made it on the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that was funny. <laughs> To lose my sight may have been considered tragic. To lose, have lost my sense of humour. Sorry. To lose my sight may have been considered tragic. To lose my sense of humour would have been catastrophic. Julie Woods, professional speaker and coach. Key number seven: Try something once. Life is a daring adventure or nothing. Helen Keller, deaf blind pioneer. I was out at the foundation of the blind fairly early on in the piece and. 
the recreation advisor came up to me and she said, Julie, would you like to go cross-country skiing? We're going away with a group of blind people. And I thought, cross-country skiing? I don't even know what it is. And I said, no, thank you. And I came home and I thought, hang on a minute. You don't even know what cross-country skiing is. And you've said, you've turned down an opportunity based on fear and ignorance. What kind of blind person are you going to make if you don't say, uh, if you say no to everything? So I made a really conscious um, decision at that moment that I would turn my no into why not. So if anyone asked me to do anything, I would try it once. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't do it again. Um, if I didn't like it, I would do it again. But I wouldn't say no based on ignorance or fear. I was at work, and it was a Friday afternoon, and the phone went in my office, and I picked it up and said, hello, as you do when you pick up the phone. And this girl um, at the other end, she's a fundraiser who I work with, a good friend, she said, what are you doing tomorrow afternoon? And I thought, I know you, you're up for something. I said, uh, nothing, why? And she goes, how would you like to referee a game of new touch rugby? <laughs> to which I said, why not? <laughs> so I went out. I did think about, oh my goodness, how am I going to tell my mother this? And she said, and before you think about not telling your mother, TV3 are going to be there. So, okay, all right, I'll tell my mother. So I told my mother and went out to uh, Middle Beach where I refereed a game of new touch rugby between the English and the All Blacks. Um, it was a curtain raiser for the test that was played later at Carisbrook that day. Um, so I was joined by a dozen naked men and me and a couple of girls as well. I wasn't naked, thankfully. <laughs> I was more worried about my fitness than um, anything because I thought, God, I hope the field's not too big. I have to chase these guys around. <laughs> we did a fake sprig test and, um, and I blew my whistle and I gave them red cards and yellow cards and they had braille on them that said, you know, you owe the ref one beer and you owe the ref two beers. And, People called out, what are you, blind or something, ref? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am. <laughs> Chasing them around. We had a fully cloaked streaker who came on the field. <laughs> but luckily there was a policeman there who was naked and he had a helmet on. <laughs> um, he came on and apprehended that streaker, so that was pretty good. So you'll be pleased to know that the All Blacks um, won that game of New Touch Rugby that day. I think it was 30 now against the English, so... Um, if I'd said no to that opportunity, I would have denied myself of one of the best um, experiences in my life and one of the most fun. So that's why it's really important to turn your no into why not. Judy Woods, professional speaker and coach. Key number eight, tell your story. What comes from books is knowledge. What comes from the heart is wisdom. Garth Brooks, American rock country artist. I was out at the foundation again and I got... Um, hit up on in the hallway by one of the fundraisers there who said, would you like to come and speak to a group of donors, Julie, um, and tell them about your blindness? And I thought, hmm, crikey, it sounds a bit dull to me, but anyway, um, I'd only been blind for a couple of years and I really didn't think that that was very interesting. In fact, I have to say in those early days I felt less than because I wasn't able to see. So I thought, well, what is my story? So I thought about it, and I thought about the kids, and I thought about the cooking that I'd been doing, and the cane, and those experiences, and those skills that I'd learned in those early days. So I, I, I said, why not? And I went back out to the foundation, and I talked to a group of donors. And to, to my surprise, um, they enjoyed hearing what I had to say. I was used to two boys running around the house, not listening to anything their mother had to say. So it was nice for me to go out to an environment where people listened to my story. It felt good, and I thought, well, maybe I can do this again. I kept doing it, and I got asked to go and speak um, at a function in Timaru for the Foundation of the Blind. So I went up to Timaru with the fundraisers, and at this meeting there were also members of the Foundation of the Blind. So that was people who were going blind or had gone blind as well. And I spoke to this group, and as I waited at the end, this man came up to me and he shook my hand and he didn't let go. And he said, thank you, Julie. He said, I'm going blind, and after hearing your story today, I'm no longer scared. And I thought, if I can do that for one person, then maybe I can do it for other people. 